Keith Hernandez joins us for this episode of the Shane Inning Podcast. Lots to discuss with Keith, the injury bug, some of these replacements coming up big. Uh, DeGrom, is he going to throw a no-hitter? It seems like everybody else is. Plus, what's going on behind the plate with McCann and Nito? It's all coming up on this episode of the Shane Inning Podcast. It starts right now. All right, welcome to the show, everybody. A reminder to please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, wherever. And Shane, anything is brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G. It's built right for the Mets from the network. More people rely on only on Verizon. We have an exciting uh, digital programming note for all of you listening. We have a new digital series here at SNY we're very excited about. And if you listen to this podcast, you're probably on Twitter. And if you're on Mets Twitter, you know who Joe DeMeo and Jacob Bresnik are. Um, it's called Mets Perspective. It's presented by Verizon. It's a bi-weekly show. It's a deep dive into the Mets farm system. And you can catch episode one on SNY.TV right now. And that episode puts the spotlight on the Mets top prospect, Francisco Alvarez. And that's what the show is going to be. It's going to be deep dives into the next potential Mets stars in their farm system. So this episode has an interview with the Mets director of player development, Jeremy Barnes. And it's just good footage, interviews, um, info that you don't know about these players and they're young and up and coming. And that's really when you want to learn about these guys. Cause it makes it so exciting when they finally do get to the show, you can check it out right now. Uh, and new episodes are online every other Thursday on SNY.TV. With that, Keith, hello to you. How's, how's Florida been treating you? Very well. I've been, uh, recuperating and rebuilding my strength and stamina for, for Monday's game. Yep, you, you'll probably need it. Um, it. Look, Keith, this team looks different every day. They're losing, you know, it seems like on average one or two players every day. Um, they've got Janeshwi Fargus and Khalil Lee in the same outfield. That has been interesting. However, uh, Khalil Lee, through all of his faults and consecutive strikeouts, has made two incredible plays in right field the last couple of days. That's just kind of the way it's going right now, Keith, that – the replacements, the bench mob, as they call it, has been kind of a breath of fresh air and in some ways has given them an attitude that, that you can't really, it, it, it seems very organic to me. Well, you've got 14 players on the IL. That is unprecedented. Uh, I've never been on a team that had 14, I mean, main, ingre- main components on the DL. Yeah. Um, IL, excuse me. Don't want to upset anybody. I admit that's my mistake. Um, it's just, I've never seen anything like it. And I've never seen two players get hurt in the same inning on separate occasions either, which happened in Tampa. Uh, so it's forced them to pretty much call up their AAA. And what's ironic is that the Mets in the offseason, everybody talks about Lindor and Carrasco, but they also got guys to strengthen their bench, and their bench has been absolutely decimated. So, um, I mean, what do you do? Sometimes teams pull together in, in adversity. Uh, I know in 86, I'm going to look this up, uh, Carter went down for a length of time, mm-hmm. and Ed Hearn filled in. And everybody was going, oh, my God, we lost Carter. Not us, but the press. And uh, Ed Hearn came in and did a great job. Phil did a great job. We, we didn't miss a skip a beat. Uh, but that was only one player, not 14. Uh, that's a whole different ball of wax right there. Uh, Nito's been great. Um, my, my hat's off to him. He's gotten some big, got, got some big hits. Uh, it was too bad they lost uh, the the, uh, the the final game in Atlanta because that would have been a nice momentum swing for them uh, to have the lead late and then give it up. Uh, that's a tough loss right there because that's the kind of thing where the team really feels good about itself. You know, we lost three straight in Tampa. We got these injuries, um, and it, it's, they just keep coming. And but we won three out of with, with our our big guy. In um, sorry about that, something came down top. That was a notification. 
I had to get rid of it because it blocked your forehead. Okay. It's important that you can see my forehead. I have to see your forehead when yeah. I'm on the air with it's you. Big enough. It's big enough. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, so it's really unfortunate they lost that game, darn it. And, you know, the bullpen's been taxed. The bullpen's been doing a great job. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do with their starting rotation, but, you know, God, and if Alonzo goes on the I.L.? I know. The, the oh, Alonzo just, thing. Oh, my God. I don't even go there. It, well, so – you know, Louie was asked before the game yesterday, what's with giving Alonzo the day off today? Like, well, he's played every day. We're giving him some rest. And then slowly it's one of those things where you're watching the game and Gary's like, why wouldn't they go to Alonzo here as the pinch hitter? And you slowly start to think, oh my gosh, he's not available, is he? We're going to hear something after the game. It's like, well, Pete wasn't available off the bench. Turns out he's got a wrist problem. He's going to get an MRI. We've heard this yeah. before. If they lose him, you know... <sighs> Keith, I thought, you know, we haven't talked to you since the Kevin Pillar injury and then the, his reaction to it. And I think it, can you imagine what it would have meant to you, especially if you were one of the, the replacements, if you can put yourselves in the, sh in yourself in the shoes of, I don't know, Jose Peraza or one of the guys who's in there and looks at the bench and sees Kevin Pillar with two black eyes um, and his nose busted up and, and bandaged. And seeing his attitude, don't you think that that would have an effect on you? It would have a great, a positive effect. Uh, not so much. You know, Peraz has been around. He's a veteran. But the guys that are here now, like Fargus, um, even Lindor, and, and you know, we, we have a veteran team, but they haven't got that many years in. It's Dom Smith has to have an impression on him. Uh, Pete. Pete Alonso has an has to have a, an impression on him and, and Conforto as well as as uh, McNeil. Um, he's kind of that. Uh, I always liked Pilar because he, he's always hustles. He plays hard. I always know he was an old fashioned hard hard nosed player. Uh, that was above and beyond the call of duty in my book. But it, it, if I was a member of that team, I would just say, "What the hell are you doing here?" You know, and you need to be getting rest. You're going to have to have major uh, surgery here, reconstructive surgery, I'm assuming. Um, and uh, for him to do that, I just thought was extraordinary. Yeah, Keith, it was just such a sign of the times because Pilar went from not being an everyday player to being such a key part of their outfield. Then he gets hit. Um, and obviously that changes. Now you have really two minor leaguers in your outfield every day. Um, and again, though, VR has been so good for them and, and has a, all, he's provided the power that I think the Mets are waiting for Lindor to provide. Lindor has been better of late, but the fact that VR has obviously done the base stealing, he's played pretty well defensively, but the fact that he's, you know, he's had some power at the plate. The Mets have really needed that during, especially the series in Atlanta. Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's, you can't rely on power from him. He does have power, but he's not a Pete Alonzo or a Conforto. It's, it's when he hits his home runs and he's hit him in good spots, you know, and that's all that counts. Uh, so um, he's played great. I mean, he's a veteran player, and that's what they got him for. Peraza's a veteran player. You know, he's, he's been doing a decent job. Uh, so that's when you get injuries to your starters and you have to use your bench, you weaken, obviously you weaken your bench. Mm -hmm. This was a team when the season started that really had a terrific bench and now it's been depleted. Not only are the everyday players hurt, but there's some bench players now that are hurt. So now you have to go to triple a and, you know, if it's going to be over a month, which Conforto and McNeil, I've hamstrings no matter what. I had one late, it was my first injury in my career when I was 30, shoot, that was 1987, the first time I got on the DL. Um, it's three weeks to let it heal. And uh, when the player feels like he's going to play, can play, give him another week. So, if you re-injure your hamstring, it's like any other muscle injury. If you re-tear re it or re-pull it, 
then it's going to be not three weeks. It's going to be six weeks. Mm. So you really got to be careful and you really got to be patient because it is a long season. This didn't happen in July or August. It's happened in early May or middle of May. It's a lot of season a month away from now. So those two ingredients, those two guys have, they've got to be very, very conservative with them. There's been, and Andy has brought this up and I want to bring up two things that we talked about earlier this week. First of all, that like Jose Martinez got hurt in spring training. That's one that we don't even think about, but he'd be very useful because he's a first base outfielder type. They could use that right now. Luis Guillorme, you know, got hurt before this barrage of injuries. But again, he was your first infielder off the bench and he's out. You know, I I think there was probably doubt within the Mets front office that Jose Peraza would ever uh, be not an everyday player, a bench player for you. He was that depth on depth. And now he's an everyday player. So to your point, Keith, um, you know, they're digging deep into the basically backup to the backup that they signed to be safe as kind of an insurance policy this offseason, which, you know, good on Zach Scott, good on Sandy Alderson. And speaking of which, um, Andy brought up earlier this week, the idea that Brian Cashman at the Yankees has always done this thing where he signs big league depth. Um, like it's nothing like he'll bring anybody who's had success in the big leagues onto his team and just see what you got. And he was curious, Andy was, to see if Zach Scott was doing that same thing. And, and he said that Cashman looks at it like the Statue of Liberty. It's, uh, it's like, give us your tired, your weak, you, you know, every, he, he wants all the players that other teams don't want just to see if they can catch lightning in a bottle. And Cameron Mabin was a signing that gives us an idea that Zach Scott's going to do that. I mean, Cameron Mabin was in AAA for the Cubs. He's had some success in the past. You have to take flyers on guys, right, Keith? I mean, you have to see if, guys who've had big league success with other teams, even though they're older, even though nobody else wants them, you have to give them a shot in this type of circumstance. Yes. And it's, it it doesn't take a genius to realize that that this is, uh, you know, all hands on deck. Uh, And uh, like I said, I've never seen a rash of injuries like this to key players. And now it's infecting the uh, starting pitching now. Uh, it, it, it's just beyond belief. So you really have no option. Are you going to throw AAA players like Khalil Lee and uh, Varg Fargus out there for a month? It's a tough spot for those young kids. Like, you never know. You might catch, uh, you know, lightning in a bottle in one of them. Uh, we certainly haven't seen that yet. It's asking a lot of those kids if they're not ready for the big leagues. And you got a team that wants to contend, which this team does, and feels they can win. Then you got to go outside and find the veterans that you can get just wholesale and plug and plug the gaps and hope they can help and hold the fort until these guys come back. It's good that you bring up the rotation, Keith. I, I can't believe you know we're however many minutes into this and we haven't. I haven't brought this up, but I, they have like nobody left. They Jacob Degrom's on the IL. Taiwan Walker's on the IL. David Peterson is not on the IL, but pitched last night and did not pitch well. Stroman is the healthy guy. Carrasco's also obviously on the IL. Syndergaard also obviously on the IL. Who am I forget? We never really had a fifth guy. We had so yeah. many rainouts and so many off days in April and May that we were able to just, just go with four. It hurt the offense more than the pitching because they need the offense needed to play and get in rhythm. Right. And that affected the offense. But uh, sooner or later, it is going to be not that many off days and you're going to need five, five starters. So to me, Gazelman's one that could start, but then you're going to have hopefully get five. You can't ask for more than from him. Uh, he's been in uh, the long, long relief role and doing a really good job. Uh, so they got things to figure out. Um, like I said, this is like, you're commanding a, a position and, and you're getting overrun by the enemy. And you've only, you, you've called up all your reserves and you got to go and 
call back to headquarters and say, I need more. Find, so find them somewhere. Yeah. And it's, just, room, it's just extraordinary. The voice on the other line says, nobody's coming. You're on your own. You know, try and make it work. I, 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 I guess reinforcements are coming. Uh, Syndergaard pitched in uh, Port St. Lucie yesterday. He pitched well. Mm-hmm. Lugo started his rehab assignment. You know, Lugo, are you really, are you really going to have Lugo come back and put him in the bullpen? I know that's where he's best, but like, if the rotation is still decimated, do you consider bringing him back as a starter and try and, and lengthen him out in his rehab assignment? And I don't and, think uh, I I don't think you bring him back as a starter. He's too valuable. The bullpen's more important in today's game. I think you can plug in Gazelman, uh, Tommy Hunter, and you may have to have two times in the rotation where you have a bullpen game. And I know when you got eight guys out there, you know, and hopefully you're going to get from Gazelman, I, I, you could get five from him, but he's got to last five innings. He can get knocked out. If he gets yeah, knocked out. It's just like Lucchese. They, they need Lucchese to give him length. And, and Lucchese, of course. Yes. Sometimes ineffective. And you've got Yamamoto. Don't, those guys are there. I think they, if, well, they'll probably – I forgot about Yamamoto. I have a hunch he might get called up. They have no choice. He's going to pitch this weekend. At least that's what Andy's, Andy reported today. Against his, He's going to pitch against the Marlins. So Yamamoto is. So that means you've got Yamamoto, Lucchese, Gesellman, to your point. Those guys can give you length. Um, if we're asking for more than two innings out of Tommy Hunter, that, that's – I'm not sure he can do that. Um, but yeah, Keith, you, you, you said it perfectly. This is, they need reinforcements. They're the enemy is approaching and they're looking around being, Oh, like, the, the enemy is at the gates. <laughs> he the, the barbarians gates. are at the gates. Yep. So, uh, but you know what? It is what it is as a team. You got to pull sometimes, like I said, if you pull together, what are you going to do? So sometimes you see a team really, really come together and uh and and fight and they get and they get a, a, a closeness an underdog yeah. feeling it's just a shame they lost that last game in atlanta that was a tough loss well that's kind of why i started the podcast with that this idea that they're kind of bonding over this because that's really what it seems like i mean it, some of these guys probably don't even know each other very well if at all but the fact that they're kind of collectively going through this together even though you'd hope if you're the Mets that your roster will look very different in September <clears throat> and potentially October. These are the kind of times that if you get through, it builds something. It's a foundation for you to build on. And I don't know. I, I think that this could end up being a good thing if all of these guys bounce back and, and are able to come back and be healthy from their injuries. And but everybody, everybody thought this division was going to be the toughest division in, in, in baseball. It's not. Everybody's no. been mediocre. Okay. So no one, it's not like it could be worse. You could be five games out and oh my gosh, we could at the end of this be 12 games out and the season's pretty much kaput, but they're in first place. Are they still in first place? I put the Philly one last night, I believe. I think, yeah, they are still in first place. I think okay. they're barely they're by. Yeah, barely. Yeah. So, it, so ev- everybody is bunched together. Yeah. No one has, um, taking a big lead so you've got room to breathe and not panic and if it stays this way you can go longer and not panic but if some team all of a sudden rips off uh 12 out of 15 that could be a problem hopefully it's the mets so um that was kind of the first of the three battle rule i forgot to introduce the segment so we're one in the second one is going to be about no hitters now keith the last couple of years has been kind of a whirlwind if you work in Major League Baseball and watch games every day like you and I both do. We had two years ago, everyone was hitting home runs. The ball seemed like it was juiced. Um, now, before this season, they changed the baseballs. And there's what, Jeff? There's six no-hitters? Seven? I, I can't remember if we're at six or seven, but Corey Kluber threw one last night. Right. So it's, it's, it's watered down the idea of the no hitter, but not just that it seems like hitters are having more trouble than ever. Um, I'm guessing you were not a fan of the juice baseballs because I, I, I there's been six, um, six no hitters. 
uh, I wasn't a fan of the juice baseballs because again, it felt like you're, you're taking away the level playing field. And can you look at stats the same way, just like the steroid era? I'm not a fan of this either because we should be celebrating Corey Kluber's no hitter instead of talking about how much it actually means. What do you think this does to the game, making it much harder to hit? Or do you think this is on the hitters for trying to do the wrong thing? I don't think that the was six no hitter so far this year. Yeah. I don't think it diminishes it at all. It's okay. still a great accomplishment. It's hard. I don't care how horse bleep the hitters are. Uh, it's hard to throw a no hitter, you know, register 27 outs and not get any, uh, any don't give up a base hit. So congratulations to those pitchers. That's not an easy thing to do. Haji zip. Um, anyway, um, uh, I disagree with you uh, in the fact that what did we see the last game against Peterson? How did they beat Peterson in the sixth? Was it the sixth inning or was it the fifth? I forget. Oh, well, they got the three runs. What did they do? He's a sinker ball pitcher. He started three. He got away from pitching inside. He fell in love with his changeup and the right hand hitters took him to the opposite field. That's how you attack an opposite arm sinker ball. That's how I would attack a, a right-handed sinker baller. Um, they, their bread and butter's away. They have to pitch inside enough. The Braves went the other way. He tired out, and that, that, that was it the sixth. He gave up three or the fifth. I think it was and then the his, fifth. Yeah, the fifth. And then he was out there a long time, and he uh, started getting the ball up. But uh, prior to that, they all went to the opposite field. And that's how you learn how to hit, make the hit. It's time for the hitters to adjust to the pitchers. It's time. And I stick with this ball, make them hit, put the ball in play. Uh, Contreras who's not a good hitter off loop. It's just, the, it's the same thing. Loop. He went the other way. We played up the middle, how, why we would open up the whole right side of the infield where a base hit ties the game on the right side of the infield and leave that whole right side open with a guy that that's a left-hander out there that he doesn't really have a sinker, but uh, he doesn't pitch. He does pitch in, but he still is bread and butters away. So that was good hitting. Okay. And it's time for the hitters to wisen up and that's all there is to it. And that's I'm, why it, it. I'm not saying that this baseball is bad. I did not like the juiced baseballs. I just feel what I don't like, Keith, is the fact that every year feels like a different game right now. And well, it's like, what, what is baseball if one year the pitchers are dominant, the next year the hitters are dominant? Like, can't we just decide which one we like? Well, I think what's happening now is, and everybody's in CYA mode up there with this launch angle, because it's their baby. This is their brainchild. And now it's caught up to them in spades. And what are you going to do to correct it? It's not, it's not happening anymore. you got guys swinging from their rear end. And now you guys are seeing a lot more pitchers now that have movement. They're not throwing over 100 miles an hour, but they have movement on their fastball and sink. And these guys swinging too hard and uh, not making contact. It's time for the hitting to change. And that's all I got to say about it. And I, I feel adamantly about it. I never liked the launch angle. I never liked swinging for home runs. I never liked, well, if you get a base hit with two outs, it's meaningless because we need two more hits. Well, how many in the 100 years of this game, how many two-out rallies have, have been, that have happened? And those are the kind of rallies that are inspiring when you put hits together. You can't do that, I agree with them, with the way you're teaching guys how to hit because it's too much less contact. I don't see any Tony Gwynn's out there or Pete Rose type hitters anymore. I, I see all these guys swinging from their rear end. They're not the tough out out there anymore. It's all or nothing. And okay, two outs, I get a base hit to left field. Oh, well, that means nothing. So you go up with two outs, nobody on. You look for a pitch that you can handle and try to hit it out of the ballpark. Well, that's bull. I, I just, it drives me crazy. And there's a the fact that they, they put this game in jeopardy. Well, I think you make a great point. And I, 
I think it is a, 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 as good an argument as you can make for the fact that baseball is in a better place with it being harder to hit than it was when the balls were juiced. And that was just going to incentivize launch angle and all or nothing and three outcomes. The game is better when there's more action and athleticism. And if, the, if this is what it's going to take to get that in 2021, then uh, uh, sure, I agree with you. I, I just want us to settle with one or the other. Like, it's just the same way as I feel with the DH in the National League. Like, just pick one and have it be here for good. Because I, I want to love the game, but I, I want to know what the stats mean. I want to know if we can look at a certain year and say, this stat means the same as 1995. Or, like, that's just the way I look at it. Um, I, do you not like the game anymore? You said you, said you want to like the game. Do you have... I, I, I love the game, Keith. But I, what I'm saying is, like, for example... Pete Alonso's rookie season where he had 50 home runs. You know what people say about that is that he, that happened in the year that the balls were juiced. So if let's say the ball changes again next year and DeGrom wins the Cy Young and he has a one five ERA, people are going to say that was the year that nobody hit. Like, can't we just pick a game and stay with it so that we can view each year okay. as independent as the same as the rest like well they say they say that about 70 68 when they lowered the mound it was a pitcher's year but it 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 evened out hitters made adjustments i gather and uh that that was the year that um that they lowered the mound after that so uh the game's always in, in adjustment it's up to the players to adjust and uh i just think that money has gotten in the way of the game players feel that they have to hit home runs to make the big, the big, the big payday to get the big contract. Uh, not enough emphasis, and that's front office is is partly to blame on this because they did put emphasis on home runs, and it, it, it and it bled down into the kids playing in in, in these uh, leagues when they're in their, their teenagers. Getting a pitcher, he won't even look at a pitcher. He doesn't do the the radar gun at 97, 98, 99. And the guy that throws 90, 91 hasn't got a chance to get drafted. It's just, to me, it, 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 it was, it's been bad for the game. And I've liked this year better watching these games. Uh, the last two years were tough to watch. But it's all the whole talk about, you talk about no hitters being diminished. And I don't think they are. The home run was diminished. It didn't mean anything for the right. la you know, last two, three years. Um, so I'm glad it's back to this. I'm seeing a lot of F8s, F7s, F9s, guys making right-hand turns. And I just sit there. I'd love to say it on the air. I just under my breath. We go to commercial. I said, mm. you guys better make an adjustment. That ball ain't going out. You're going to be hitting 220. You're going to find yourself in AAA pretty soon. You don't but watch that, out. That point you made is kind of, and I hope you understand what I'm saying. It's, that's the, the point that I'm making is the, the home run was diminished and now no hitters are being diminished. Like I just want to get us to a place where we're not diminishing any stat that used to be great. Like it, it's the games in a steady place where the competitive balance is there and where the game is exciting. And I don't know. I just feel like it's we're, too, we're it's both too bad. dreams right now. It's too bad. They made a lot of the ballparks small too, because you know, the, the big gaps requires better defenders Mm -hmm. guys that can cover ground more, more doubles more doubles triples are very exciting runners scoring from first on a double very exciting uh a base hit up the middle close play at the plate how many times we see a third base coach hold up a runner who can run can't score in a single last night and the, don't tell me it's the genius is up there that well we're going to play this guy hitting him. we're going to play shallow it's just that the ballparks are small and that's not fun base by base it's it's boring you know, you want to see the third base coach giving him the go sign. And that's excitement. So they got these parks built. I don't know what they're going to do. They can't expand them. You know, no. worst case, I guess that's why you build them too big, like City Field. Worst case, you bring them. Well, in. you can always you, bring them you in. Bring them out. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Yep. Um, all right. Quickly, two more Mets topics, because I kind of veered us off topic with the Mets specifically. Um DeGrom, I mean, the, it, isn't it strange, Keith, that in the year of the no-hitter, he has never really come that close to throwing one? Do you think by year's end, you will be in the booth 
and he'll get to like the seventh or eighth inning flirting with one. I always feel every time he goes out there, he has the potential to throw a no hitter. And there are some lineups out there that got a lot of patsies. So I won't say which teams those are, but I always feel he has a really good chance to go out there and throw one. And we'll see if you're right. And some of those patsies flailing at the sliders, and then you'll know by the fifth or sixth that you got a shot. Once again, you're listening to the Shane Anything podcast brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets. From the network, more people rely on only on Verizon. Last thing, Keith, I was just thinking of James McCann because to your point about the third base coach, D. Sarcina gave him, uh, held him up last night at third. I thought it would have been an interesting time to pinch run for him uh, or maybe have him score. The Mets ended up scoring that run anyway. Um, but he's been a topic of conversation because Tomas Nito has been so good, Keith. Um, do you think it's time to give Nito closer to a 50, 50 split behind the plate? I think Nito, uh, I think what they're doing right now is just perfect. You've got uh, McCann who's so good defensively and so is Nito. Um, I just think that you don't have to wear them out. Uh, you don't have to like Gary Carter catching 130 games or, you know, Yadier Molina catching 155 you know, games. So I think you can keep them strong. And, and Nito's done a really, really terrific job. Uh, and he's a good defender as well. He's been getting, he's been getting clutch hits of late. Mm -hmm. So I think you can sprinkle them in together. But I still think uh, unless McCann doesn't hit, which he's struggling now since the opening date, you know, he's hitting almost on the interstate. If that continues, then maybe – you start sprinkling and Nito in a little more. We'll see. But there's a lot of guys. Dom's struggling. Mm -hmm. Dom doesn't look good, and he hasn't made any adjustment. He had, I don't see him turn the corner right now. Uh, Lindor is struggling. Um, you got a lot of pieces that are healthy that are struggling at the plate, you know? Yeah. All the guys who were hitting well are on the IL, but all the guys who've been struggling are just left out there to struggle to your point. And let's just um, hope, let's hope the MRI on Pete is negative. Jeez. Yeah. Well, I noticed he had the wrist thing on in Tampa and we just, uh, we, we should have probably sent uh, our ACE reporter down there uh, and, and found and had him uh, search around. Yeah. But Steve uh, and Gelbs, you know, Gelbs, Stevie. but Gelbs is in the, uh, the the booth right next to you i know he, he can't even he can't even fly to tampa um and investigate at the trop he's just got to no. guess uh, looking at the monitor like the rest of you so evidently uh, it was when he got hit by a pitch about 10 days ago i wish i could convey this and i'm sure the trainers do right when i was invited to my first big league camp when i was 19 years old maybe yes 19 two years out of high school my roommate was Ron Hunt, the, who got hit all the time. And Ron was on his last legs. He told me, when you have a, a, a contact injury, you always put ice on it. Go home, ice it, ice bandage, tape. And in the middle of the night, you'll wake up and that ice will melt and you'll be throbbing because you got to get up out of bed, re-bag that, re-ice that bag and put the ice on. It'll last through the night. And you'll wake up in the morning and you'll have no swelling. I never missed the game by hitting the elbow or the wrist because I did that. It was one of the great lessons of my, of my early, of, of my career. Thank God the Cardinals put me in the same room with Ron Hunt. I'm sure Ron Hunt was sitting there at 35 going, what did they put me with this 19 year old minor leaguer for? But you know what? Uh, to this day, I get a chance to thank him. And uh, that's to me, whenever it, it, it's a must so I well, don't know. that's not just a baseball lesson to all of our listeners. Next time you stub your toe or you, you hit your shin on something, listen to Ron Hunt, uh, bag the ice when you wake up and it's throbbing and melted and your bed is covered in the water, <laughs> rebag re the ice and you'll wake up in the morning. You'll be fine. But I, I do find it interesting that, that uh, every time guys get hit with fastballs these days, Trainer goes back in, they stay in the game. Eventually, maybe they come out, they get an x-ray, which are always negative. The MRI is really what shows the injury. And a lot of times the players don't want to get those because they're like, I'm fine. I can move it. Everything's good. I broke my foot a couple of years ago. And it just stress fractures like the small, tiny bones in your foot. 
X-ray doesn't show anything. It's the MRI where you have to find those small little breaks in those, those bones and hands are the same way. You know, it's like, Uh, let's hope not because there's so many little bones in the wrist and in the hand. There's so many little, uh, let's just hope that he's okay. I want to make one point. I know that I've been kind of ranting here. I want to make this reiterate this one point. I have liked watching baseball this season more than the last three years. I thought okay. you came across clear saying that. Okay. I, okay. I, I, I just I want to reiterate that said. because I've been the last the three years. Some of I've been the grump were, between us. Uh, the last three years, uh, some of these games have been, in, I mean to tell you, impossible to watch. Uh, but this year, I, I like the direction the game's going. And I'm really, I'm enjoying baseball. If, okay, I wanna... Between the two of us, Keith, I've been the grumpy one, not you. You're, you're saying you like watching the game now. You did call the hitters. Better. Horse, you called the hitters horse bleep, but that was for a reason. I just want baseball to decide what it wants to be. That's my only frustration. I, 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 I don't have the game to look back on like you do. Like the game, I, went, I lived through really the, the height of the steroid era. That's when I fell in love with the game. So I guess if you're me, Keith, and you fell in love with the game in the late 90s, baseball's just been like, what is it doing? The whole time, I mean, Andrew McCutcheon wins an MVP in whatever it was, 2012, with like 82 runs batted in. Uh, Todd Helton finished like 20th in an MVP race with like 140 runs batted in, all within my lifetime. So I, I just feel like baseball has been three different sports since I've been a fan of it. I just kind of want it to steady out. Maybe to your point earlier, it never does. And the hitters just kind of adjust and the game changes. But that, that's the source of my frustration. I think the root of all evil in the game was the steroid era. That's everybody fell in love with McGuire and Sosa and the home run chase. And, you know, the same thing happened, in the, but it was the dead ball era and Babe Ruth changed that changed the game with the home run. And the next biggest change was the steroid era. And that was chemically infused. And, um, now this, this uh, analytic era we're in has changed the game. Uh, so there's been, it would took what, what, 1920 when Ruth came in with the home runs around then big change in the game changed it. It took that long uh, for the steroid era to change the game again. And now we've had two with the analytics now and the change of how they, how they manage a game and do everything differently. So there's been two big changes since 1990 in yeah. this game. And I think it needs to stabilize. Yeah. So I agree with you. Uh, just a reminder to subscribe to Shane Anything at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And the Shane Anything podcast is brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets from the network. More people rely on only on Verizon. Keith, a pleasure as always. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will talk to you in the coming weeks. Good luck getting back in the booth. Glad you're rested, ready to go. And uh, hopefully we'll be watching some good baseball and and the Mets will get a little healthier as we go forward. Thanks, Keith. Great. Thanks for listening, everybody. Talk to you next week.